Hey friends, happy midweek and good evening to you all. I'm glad that you're joining with us tonight and I hope that you've taken some time to just go outside today. It was really beautiful as far as the temperature goes and probably a record high, I think, in some areas they're saying. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be the last real good day that we're going to have for this year. And I'm sure we're going to end up paying for it come early next year when winter decides to hit hard. But hey, I hope that you found some time to get out there and just enjoy. I know your thermostat at home is probably wondering what in the world is going on. And uh, But hey, we'll take advantage of every opportunity we can to be outside and just enjoy nature. So I hope that you've done that today. We are currently in a series as we're leading up to Christmas called At The Movies Christmas Edition. And what we're doing is going through some of my favorite all-time Christmas movies. And some of them you may agree with and maybe you have some of your own. Um, I'm just, I'm a sucker for Christmas movies. I just, I like them. Not all of them are going to be on this list, obviously. And uh, some of them are more popular with the youngsters than they are with me, but I figured we'd probably talk about it anyway. And today is one of those movies. And today's theme or movie that we're going to talk about is The Grinch and any of its varieties. I love the Jim Carrey version. I love the little cartoony versions. And my kids probably love it a little more than I do. But this time of year, I mean, The Grinch is always on. And you've probably read these books to your kids. They've probably read these books. Maybe your grandma's read these books to you. And uh, these are just real popular, popular books and now movie. And uh, it's just a good story. You know, you've got the Grinch who lives on this cliff that overlooks Whoville. And he's been up there for 50-some years. And he's just a grumpy old dude. You know what I mean? And the book says that it's because his heart is two sizes too small. And But here's the question that we really need to ponder is what makes someone's heart two sizes too small? Physically, was it too small? We don't know. We know that it grows by the end of the story, but what makes someone's heart small? And so today we're going to talk about the idea of what bitterness can do, bitter and anger and all those things can do to you and I. And so the, then some of the varieties of the stories that's been coming out with the Grinch, I mean, he's just a grumpy fellow. That's why they call him the Grinch. He was just bitter, just, just a broken guy. And he robbed everybody of the joy that they would have over Christmas time. And if you know the Who Village and the, and the Who's out there, um, they just were just these little beings that just were constantly happy. It's just what they were. They just always radiant with joy. And when the Christmas season would come by, they would just have even more joy. And they would have big festivals, and they'd like this ginormous Christmas tree, and all the good stuff, and all the joy that they would have, and community events, and everything like that was just enough to just make the Grinch sick. And he would just go crazy in trying to make sure that he can ruin Christmas. Now let me ask you this on more of a personal note. Have you ever had a time in your life, maybe through a holiday season, perhaps Christmas even, where someone or something has robbed you of your joy. It's hard to get back, isn't it? And we all go through moments, I know, we all go through moments where we're just sour. You know what I mean? And it could be a circumstance, it could be a person, and we are just, we're, we're filled with this bitterness which leads to poison. It's like a poison that we put inside of our life. And I, I know you may say, well, Brandon, you can't help how you feel and I'm not sure I, I agree with that because the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 10.5, says that you and I have to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And so in that regard, I think we can kind of control our feeling and how we respond to certain situations. And I know that there are people out there in your life and in your world who has wronged you, who has done some terrible, terrible things to you. And uh, that's something that you've got to work towards and work through. And some of those bridges seem to be a lot harder to cross than others. I get that. But if you constantly allow the bitterness to just reign within you and just fill your life, all of a sudden it becomes like a volcano that you spew out to other people. And when people are trying to celebrate things, you don't celebrate with them. When people are celebrating a promotion, celebrating a childbirth, celebrating a marriage, or the fact that they're in a new relationship, or the fact that they're in their seventh relationship this year, and you just kind of just let the bitterness overtake you, and although you may give them a cheeky smile, deep down inside you're like, man, they don't deserve that. I've been single for this many years, or I've been broke for this many years, or whatever the circumstance is, and we start to tie ourselves into their celebration. And it's really easy to do. You know, especially this time of year, because as we start celebrating Christmas, a lot of people pass out gifts to one another. And uh, and it's because, you know, we love each other, obviously, that we do that. But, 
Your gift may not be the best or your gift may not be the most expensive as somebody else in the room, especially when you get the big family group together. And sometimes it just weighs in on you or you start to compare what you're able to give to what other people are giving and you come up short and you just can't help but be bitter towards that person and then the Grinch just comes out of you. And sometimes it leads to uh, an event where you speak up and all of a sudden it goes from this to that to that. Or maybe you just mellow down and you get really quiet and just when people come and ask you, hey, are you doing all right? You seem kind of quiet. Oh yeah, I just don't feel good. I ate too many of this or ate too much of that or drank too much eggnog and, and I'm just, you know, I'm just, just kind of chilling. But deep down inside you're angry and you're hurt and you're upset. And bitterness can carry so many different faces. I mean, it really can. And I want to look at two different stories. First is Job from the Old Testament. Now, Job, he lost everything. So if you think that you've had it bad, you need to go read his story in the first few chapters where Satan has literally asked God if he can go down and test Job, his servant Job. And God's like, well, okay. And the reason Satan wants to is because the only reason he believes that Job is remaining faithful to God is because God has poured his blessing out on Job. But God knows that Job is faithful because Job is just faithful. He's one of those kind of guys. He's righteous because of his own doing, not because of the blessings that he has. So he allows Satan to go ahead and mess with Job. Uh, gives him a little bit of an ultimatum, though, at the beginning. Okay, He just says, listen, you, you can do whatever you want to to Job. You just can't touch him. And so he goes down, and all of a sudden, everything gets destroyed. His children, his livestock, his money, all, all of it just gets wiped away in the in just the blink of an eye. I mean, it's just, it's chaos. And then Satan goes back and he says, well, the only reason he remains faithful is because you wouldn't let me touch him. And God says, well, go back and touch him. You just got to spare his life. So Satan goes back, puts these boils all over his body. And then, I don't know if you've ever had a boil before, but I've had things that they hurt. And if it is a boil, if I'm thinking of the right thing, those things are painful. And that was just one. I couldn't imagine being covered head to toe, so bad that the Bible says Job had to break a clay pot and scrape his skin because it was that bad. The agony was just high there. And it gets to the point where Job remains faithful, but his wife is starting to harbor bitterness. And most of us would say rightfully so. She just lost her children. She's watching her husband fall apart and all the finances that she thought she knew, everything that they had in their household is now being swept away, meaning their cattle and all their livelihood has now been destroyed. And Job's over here singing praises to God and she's dwelling within this bitterness to the point where she looks at her husband and says, listen, just quit playing this game and curse God and die. Why would you remain faithful when God has allowed this to do it? Just curse God and die. Let's just be done with the games. Let's be done with all of it. Now, of course, that's my paraphrase, but essentially that's what that reads. And we see bitterness really play out here. The second story I want to get to tonight, our midweek, comes from Acts chapter 8. And it's talking about a guy who is a sorcerer. His name's Simon. And I just want to read the story to you. It comes from Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 9. And it says, Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. Rightfully so. If everyone's looking at you and paying attention to the to the things that you can do, and everybody loves a good magic trick, then of course they're going to be drawn to you. And it says in verse 10 that all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. So he titled himself, or people have just been giving him this title, that he is a great power of God. Verse 11, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. So this guy must have been really good at what he did. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and named Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And because of it, and because the Holy Spirit has not yet come on any of them, they had simply just been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and when they received the Holy Spirit, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying of the hands of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, "Give me also the ability, so that everyone in whom I may lay my hands on may receive." 
the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's just kind of wrap this whole thing up. So this guy's over doing magic tricks, and everyone's fascinated by the by the gift that he's apparently able to do. And uh, but also Philip's in town preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. So the crowd is amazed by Simon, but they're hearing Philip preach, and all of a sudden, just the whole crowd is just amazed. And what's being talked about. And so what they do is like anyone does. What do I need to do now to be saved? What must I do? And I imagine Philip said the same thing that Peter did at the, at the beginning of the letter, right? In Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of the sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so I imagine that was the message that they're all proclaiming. And so everyone went to get baptized. Here's where things get tricky. Where were their motives in the baptism? And my question is, why hasn't the Holy Spirit come upon them yet? Right? Because at baptism, the Holy Spirit is connected, right? At baptisms, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so why didn't the Holy Spirit? Well, I don't know. And that could be a lesson for another day. But now Simon is over here and he too was baptized and still hasn't received the Holy Spirit yet. And so they start seeing that, that, that Peter and John and all of them are sitting here laying hands and all of a sudden the Spirit is coming onto them and they're laying hands and the Spirit is coming. And so Simon says, now wait a minute. He goes, I, I haven't gotten the spirit yet. I was baptized. I heard all this. And so he says, what money, how much do I need to pay you? I'll pay whatever it is because I've got a great sideshow over here where people give me lots of money and I perform great miracles and I will pay whatever you ask for me to have this gift. And Peter responds in verse 20. He says, may your money perish with you because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Well, why is his heart not right before God? And why didn't he receive the Holy Spirit? Well, Peter answers it. Verse 22, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in your, pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of what? Bitterness and captive to sin. That's it. He basically shows him, he says, listen, the reason why none of this has worked for you is because your heart wasn't in the right place because bitterness is a poison that's leaking out. His motives weren't pure. He didn't go to get baptized so that he can be in a relationship with Christ. He wanted to have the power of God, which is why he's offering all this money. And Peter says, you need to go to the Lord and repent of this wickedness that is coming from your heart because that's what poison does. Now, in the Grinch story, he all of a sudden saw the joy that came from these people. And this little who girl basically wanted to teach the Grinch what Christmas was all about. And he figured it out. And it says his heart grew th three sizes. And the Grinch fell in love with Christmas and wanted to celebrate. That's the end of the story. But the problem is, is they don't really end it here. Right? Look at verse 24. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing that you've said may happen to me. And after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem and started preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So he just simply says, can you guys pray for me too? And that's the end of the story. And so we don't really know if, if Simon has changed his heart, if he started pursuing God or if he just got frustrated and allowed the bitterness to carry over. But my message tonight is that if we're not careful, the bitterness that we've been harboring in our life for many, many years can just come out whenever it wants to. And sometimes it comes out on the wrong people at the wrong time. And rather than sitting back and celebrating the joy that they're uh, celebrating, whether it's a promotion, whether it's a great Christmas gift, whether it is the, the seventh girlfriend this year, whatever it is, rather than celebrating with them, we take a step back and we'd rather curse them in our mind. We'd rather be bitter about their successes and say, woe is me. I should have had this. I should have had that. And yet you're getting it. You don't deserve it. And what bitterness does is just takes us down a train ride that we don't want to go on. And my, my, my hope for you this Christmas season is that you can tap into the joy that is just all around us, that you have a relationship with God that in spite of all your circumstances, you find peace that only you can have in a relationship with Christ. That way you can start to celebrate other people and their successes rather than being bitter in heart and poison all over everyone else. Friends, I hope you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. If not, we'll see you next Wednesday for our midweek before Christmas. Have a great week.